we've had five or six large cap growth booms now for the last 50, 60 years. They all worked fine without really low interest rates. Uh, you know, it's mostly, I think, about psychology and about momentum and about the narratives. Those sort of multiples have ended in grief. And the multiple today is quite a bit higher than it was at the peak of the um, tech boom in March 2000. Many booms are exactly around that sort of theme. What's the next, you know, great winner? How is that possible given how much value is underperformed? Well, something else has happened. Because there are the fundamentals, and then there's the stock market. And the stock market decides on the multiples. That's the sentiment part, if you will. I think that's really worth noting. This has built up over three years, and it won't disappear overnight. Where do I start? Um, I mean, you're probably aware that ASIC is not in the habit of commenting on the stock market, and, but you saw that they did. Uh, you know, ASIC came out and said that, you know, I think they, their statistics were that in the June quarter there were 300 stocks that more than doubled in price. And they noted that in those stocks, 80% of the trades were uh, individual investors, which is not normal, it's normally 10 to 15. And they also noted that of those stocks, 80% were loss makers, and the other 20% were on average on 55 times. So um, there's something going on. Uh, and it's, as I say, it's unusual for ASIC to actually comment on the stock market. So they were obviously a little bit concerned. Look, the first one was really all about uh, learning a little bit from history, um, in the sense that, you know, uh, uh, most stock market booms, bubbles, wh 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 whatever you want to call them, start with some good fundamentals and, and sometimes they get extrapolated and become fully blown, you know, uh, excess. And very often it is uh, they're inspired by a particular stock or sector that, you know, does remarkably well. Um, you know, there's, there, there's, there's the uh, old Poseidon boom example in Australia, which was really motivated a couple of years before by Western mining, because there was a, a nickel boom, because uh, the Western world only had really two nickel mines. And when there was a strike at one of them, the nickel price really spiked, and suddenly there was a nickel boom on. And... Um, Western Mining uh, found a deposit and developed it in 18 months. Uh, the mine manager was Avi Pabo, who of course became Sir Avi and the chairman of, 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 of Western Mining. And that mine made Western Mining. It was a, 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 a wannabe uh, little fish and it became a major mining house in Australia due to that. Stock ended up about up 40 fold uh, over a couple of years. And that set off that sort of wealth creation that really resonates with people, you know, um, uh, greed and envy in particular. And there was a fully fledged nickel boom that ended in that phenomenal run by Poseidon in 69. I think it went up something like 600 fold um, before uh, the bubble burst. Um, and most of the stock market actually in the late 60s, uh, and this is how Trevor Sykes describes it, was all about what's the next Western mining. And very many booms are exactly around that sort of theme. What's the next, you know, great winner? And in that boom, there wasn't one. And if I sort of skip forward to, to some of the more recent ones, we had the tech boom, uh, you know, 20 odd years ago. And, at the, and I lived through this and it was all about Microsoft. Because, you know, uh, as a value manager, I remember, t you know, saying to people, you know, gee, it's dangerous to invest on 60 times. But the answer was, but Microsoft. Because Microsoft had done phenomenally well. It too was up, you know, hundred folds over something like 20 years. A remarkable record of earnings growth. And a lot of it was about finding that next Microsoft. Now it turned out in that boom, there wasn't really another Microsoft. And even Microsoft fell 75% on the other end of it. But that was the inspiration because you know, that wealth creation really, really uh, uh, makes people think, well, you know, I, I too could get, you know, get one of these make me rich in one, in one investment type of stocks. Because something like 500 times, that's what it does, right? So it's a siren song, if you will. Um, now in Australia, we had, a, we had an equivalent boom because we just imitated the US. But I think one of the things that come, came, uh, came out of what, what I wrote about for me was that the quality of the Australian tech stocks uh, in that boom 20 years ago was really very low. In other words, um, uh, you know, we just took some very ordinary stocks and put them on really high multiples as a, as a way of imitating the US. And what, you know, everybody knows the NASDAQ fell 80% on the other side. Well, uh, the information technology sector on the ASX fell 70% against the NASDAQ that fell 80%. So 
So, and none of these stocks, you know, and uh, you, you might remember some of the names too, you know, Solution 6 and Sausage Software and Pineapple.com and OneTel and Liberty One and all these names, none of them survived, right? Um, but then we had the mining boom, and the mining boom was inspired to, n to not a small degree by Fortescue. You know, what a remarkable story that was. You know, stocks the you know, stock traded one to two cents, you know, just as the Nasdaq was was was, was tipping over, and it ended up at twelve dollars. So again, you know, something like uh, you know, eight hundred fold gains, um, and that inspired a whole raft of small mining companies to to get a lot of market caps. Remember, at one stage we had a very large wannabe iron ore sector. Uh, you know, um, and in that boom too, there never was another, uh, an, another Fortescue. In that sense, phenomenal success is almost by definition rare, right? That doesn't stop people from looking at them and thinking, well, I wish I could find one of those. And now, of course, it's relevant because we have the, the fang boom. And um, of the fangs, you know, two of the most impressive ones are, are Facebook and Google. Um, who've gone their earnings just in spectacular fashion you know, over the last 10 years. They probably have, they have, clearly have m m monopolistic characteristics in terms of data, Facebook for public data, you know, Google for private data. Um, but um, it may well turn out that, well, firstly, that there is no other you know, data monopoly that emerges out of this. There's also the possibility that the monopolies can't be sustained because they are perhaps too powerful. And um, there's obviously a lot of concern about these companies outside the US and even within the US where they're, they're local champions. There is obviously some political you know, uh, uh, pushback and some questions being asked. And of course in the past, you know, railway network, telephone network, um, some of these monopolies in the past had to be regulated or broken up. Um, but the point for Australia is, um, it's un we may not have another one of those in the US, but the chances of us having one of these in Australia is really probably quite low. And one of the ways you can test this is you can, you know, whether these few stocks in the US are unique, is you can look at the earnings growth. Right? So you go back 10, 15 years, and in the US, you know, earnings growth has been double digit for that length of time, driven particularly by some of those leaders. You look at the uh, infotech sectors in London, or in Tokyo, or in Frankfurt, or in Australia, and the earnings growth is very underwhelming. They are, in that sense, they are ordinary companies. Facebook and Google are special. So I think uh, the risk is that the market extrapolates those successes to the Australian market, and we end up with just very high multiples on stocks that are really not the same quality. Look, I mean, a little bit like 20 years ago, whenever I open the paper, I, I, I hear the story that it's all about disruption. Um, and there's this idea that you know, um, some of these growth stocks, particularly the digital disruptors, are doing really, really well and they're doing this at the expense of the traditional value stocks who are being disrupted. Um, and I think that's, that's reasonably widely accepted. But very rarely does anybody quote any numbers. In fact, I've never seen anybody quote any numbers. So um, we thought about, well, can, we, you know, can this be tested? And it turns out it's, it's not easy to test because you know, calculating exactly what the earnings growth is between value and growth, for example, when stocks move between the two, and all these sort of issues is actually very difficult. But very fortunately, we have um, the index providers, S&P and MSCI. And they furnish us with um, very carefully calculated indices daily, all the right adjustments and so forth. And using, let's say, the MSCI data, they don't just give you the returns and the, and the, and the cum accumulation returns, they also give you EPS and PE ratios. So we can actually uh, go back and say, well, what has happened over that last cycle to the earnings of um, value portfolios and growth portfolios? Um, so if we look at the MSCI data, for example, um, and what we wanted to do, we wanted to see how this looks in the longer term, because you know, this is supposed to be a structural shift. And we thought we would do it um, cycle peak to cycle peak. So the last cycle peak was mid-2007. In mid-2007, GFC hadn't been thought of yet, um, and rate interest rates were still quite high, and then you go into that GFC, and then the so-called secular stagnation period, interest rates kept on dropping, um, all the way to the start of uh, 2020, when the economy was still fine. So we've gone to March 2020, 
um, to sort of compare peak to peak because you don't want to compare a trough to peak because then the cyclical stocks are going to be clearly advantaged. So I think that's a reasonably fair comparison. And then we looked at just, well, what was the earnings growth if you invested in the, um, in the two alternatives, yeah? the value portfolio or the growth portfolio? And it turns out over those 12 odd years through that long uh, bull market and the secular stagnation era, so-called, um, the EPS you owned at the end in the value portfolio was about 7% higher than that in the growth portfolio. So that clearly goes against the narrative. But as they say, wait, there's more. Because um, your, ret your fundamental return is driven by the EPS growth, but also by your dividends. Because you know, in accumulation return, you can reinvest those dividends, and then you also uh, own some more earnings by reinvesting the dividends. And of course, the value index has a higher dividend yield. So when you look at the accumulated um, EPS plus dividend yield, the fundamentals, the value uh, portfolio was in fact ahead by 41% over that period. Now, very important to note here that this includes the, if you will, uh, the value process because stocks migrate between the two. But they do it in a very me mechanical fashion for MSCI, so it's all very transparent and it's external data, but the difference is 41%. Again, this doesn't quite fit the, um, fit the, fit the narrative. Um, now you may ask, how is that possible given how much value is underperformed? Well, something else has happened because there are the fundamentals and then there's the stock market. And the stock market decides on the multiples. That's the sentiment part, if you will. And um, during that period, the PE for that half of the market, so this is a big, a big number of stocks, for that half of the market rose 82% relative to that value half. 82%. And of course, when, uh, when you get that 82% PE increase, that overwhelms the 41% higher fundamentals, and you end up with uh, the whatever 20% underperformance that the uh, value index had from mid-07 to, uh, to March 2000. It's very different to what uh, most people, I think, assume. And it does show you that um, it really has been driven by multiples, not by the fundamentals. In the short term, it doesn't matter how you've made your money, right? Um, you know, if, uh, if I think of, for example, the, our info information technology sector, you know, it got to 50, 60 times earnings, whatever, in the tech boom. And then for 16 years, it spent, um, from I think middle of 01 to late 17, it traded on less than 20 times forward. And at the end of August, it was on 76 times forward suddenly. So you've made a lot of money on the multiple. But you know, in the long run, um, paying more and more for a dollar of earnings is not a way to sustainably create wealth. You need to own more earnings. So um, the timing question is the really big one. And you know, if you ask me that question, clearly I can't give you an answer because you know, um, if, if I find you the answer to that question, I, you know, I'd be trading derivatives or something like that. But um, so you can't uh, say when that catalyst will come and how it will come about. But certainly in the past, um, you know, those sort of multiples have ended in grief. And the multiple today is quite a bit higher than it was at the peak of the um, tech boom in March 2000. Now, some of that I should add is due to the fact that we are in a downturn and the earnings for that sector have obviously fallen because some of these companies are quite cyclical. But nevertheless, uh, you know, even if you adjust for that, the multiples are you know, really very high. So it becomes very difficult to, to make get a good return from that starting point. Um, you know, I, I lived through the tech boom, and to this day, I can't really tell you what the catalyst was. There are various theories about you know, liquidity for Y2K and um, it getting withdrawn or whatever. But you know, in March 2000, suddenly the NASDAQ became very volatile, and it suddenly was up and down and up and down, and it didn't actually fall very much for the first six months. Even by September, it was barely down to the, where it was at the end of 99, and then it suddenly unraveled because people you know, lost faith in it. Um, enough people thought that, yep, I've made a great lot of money, time to sell, and it then fell very dramatically for the next sort of two, three years. And I think that's really worth noting. This has built up over three years, and it won't disappear overnight. It will be many months and quarters and a bit of up and down in the process. 
um, if the past is any guide? Look, that's a really good question. And um, yes, you do ask yourself that question because um, the future is unknowable and things do change. Um, but you, know, you made reference to two mechanisms that have also been proposed as an explanation for that, rates and, 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 you know, the, the, and the, the sort of accounting. So let me comment on both of those, and I apologise in advance for the fact that they're not easy sort of um, easy explanations because they'll be technical. But I think the first thing is interest rates. Um, and the first thing to note about um, the, this explanation for why, uh, you know, uh, growth P's can be higher now forever, is the fact that the appeal is that the discount rate has fallen more than the growth rate. And when you get that, then the PEs overall for the market go up, but they go up more for long duration securities than for short duration securities. But it's really important to, to realise that it is a second order differential effect. Right? And conversely, if the discount rate has fallen a lot because the growth rate has fallen, and they've fallen more or less in step, there's no PE effect and there's no duration effect. So one of the things you can say is that um, for the market to be consistent with that theory, all PEs have to go up a lot. Now we do have a bit of evidence here, um, and let me run through some of them. The first one is um, that whenever it comes to low rates and secular stagnation, Japan. Right? They went there before us, they've, uh, they've had this for you know, uh, now 30 years, and in Japan, as rates fell very dramatically from 4-5% or eventually to negative, um, PEs did not go up. Value performed very well, thank you very much, except for the quick interludes of the FANG and the, and the, and the, and the tech booms. So there's no evidence there that they are negative rates even, has had that effect. And if you don't get a PE effect, then there's no differential effect on value growth. Um, I'll also note, as, an, as, a, as, a, as another bit of evidence, uh, uh, the last tech boom. In, it inflated while rates were gently going up and the economy was strong. It deflated while the economy was weak and rates fell to the then unheard of 1%. Completely against the sort of narrative that somehow value needs a big growth boom or high rates or anything like that. That's, n that's not how it played out there. Similarly, uh, on that theory, uh, European uh, PEs should be much higher than those in the US, shouldn't they? because they've had negative rates now for years. That's not what's happened. A bit more systematically, Jared Minak has, some, has done some numbers, and he suggests that um, at very low interest rates, P is actually lower. And the reason for that is that very low interest rates tell you there's a problem. Right? There's something not right with the economy. So that's my first point. If you do not get a rise in overall P's, there is no such effect. Right? The second point, is a little bit more technical, but it's simply this. Namely, if, let's say, it does happen, and this is different to everything that's gone before, and now we get this P uplift and they will stay high, they, they should have an impact in certain fixed ratios. So in Australia, you know, the average growth stock, uh, you might think, has about 20 years duration. The average value stock, 14 years duration. Now, when rates fall, it's not the case that the 20-year bond rallies, but the 14-year doesn't. They both rally but they rally to a different degree because one has more duration than the other. So what you should see is that the P's for value and growth stocks both inflate in certain ratios. Now, um, uh, you know, um, I think you have the data in, in your hand there, um, but, you know, and I, but I can tell you that uh, you know, the, the P for value stocks has really not gone up at all. All the increase has been for the growth stocks. As I, as I mentioned a moment ago, on average about 80% since you know, the last 12 years. That's completely inconsistent internally. Because if there is such a duration, a differential duration effect, it has to happen in fixed ratios, right? You know, uh, and in the bond market, um, I think everybody's really familiar with this. You know, the 14-year bond, bond rallies just a bit less than the 20-year bond you know, when, when rates fall. So again, uh, you know, what is out there is not really consistent with that. And I think it's fair to say that um, you know, we've had five or six large cap growth booms now for the last 50, 60 years. They all worked fine without really low interest rates. Uh, you know, it's mostly, I think, about psychology and about momentum and about the narratives and those sort of effects, rather than this being the one boom that is, you know, really strictly based on, on the fundamentals of lower rates. As I say, the evidence around the world is just not there to, to, to really support that, although in theory, you know, if it did happen, 
you would see this increase, but you would see an increase in both types of PEs. 